So it is very hard to predict the stock market. Right, you have all these, start, all these stocks trading, uh, Heineken trades, Philips trades, Apple trades, all these companies have stocks. Uh, it's very hard to predict which stocks will do well and which stocks will do poorly. Like on every, any given day, the stock price can go up or it can go down. If you are able to predict these movements, uh, you can actually make a lot of money. So I guess for that reason, many, many people are interested in stock prices. Uh, I myself, I study finance, or I teach finance, uh, I do research in finance, and I'm not the only one. Many people actually do research in finance, and we have been doing so for many, many years. So you must think by now, we must be good at it, right? After all these years, we should be able to predict where the markets go up and down. Well, indeed, uh, we think we are, and we created a game to really show how good we are. Is what we do is we pick some of our best traders, our professional traders, and we make a team of those and we let them select stocks. But we also choose a competitor. We compete against something else. Well, who do we compete against? We compete against monkeys. So this is the game. We have our best professional traders. Uh, they think which stocks will do well, say, over the next month, for the next year. Uh, so they will pick the Heineken, the Philips, whatever company they think will perform well. The monkey, he enters a room. It's a chimpanzee in the US. In Holland, we have a gorilla. Uh, the monkey enters the room. There are tons of bananas in there. And every banana has a word written on it. So the word will be Apple or, ben or uh, Microsoft or Philips. And the monkey just starts eating. Whatever, whichever bananas it eats, that are the stocks in the monkey's portfolio. And this is really a game. If for some reason we don't have monkeys, we'll just throw darts at the financial newspaper, and then that's the portfolio. Can you think of any other profession in which you would invent such a game? Test your knowledge against something random? Well, we do, and we're actually very, very proud if we win, which we usually don't. We lose more uh, than we win. How is this possible? How can it be so hard, even after all this research, to predict stock prices? Say, think of Apple uh, in, in a few months or next year, it will introduce its new iPhone. And you think, or you know pretty much, that it will be popular, right? Many people will probably want to buy this iPhone. So at that point in time, Apple will get a lot of money. And a lot of money will transfer from the people to, uh, to Apple. So maybe the company is worth more than stock prices should go up. Uh, so say, you think this, you think, well, I really want to have an, an Apple stock in a few, few months. But then you think, oh, I might just as well buy it now, right? If you think stock prices go up in the future, why not buy it now? But you're probably not the only one thinking that. In fact, many people, their whole job is predicting the future. So they would already have bought Apple before you even thought of it. Pretty much all the information that is out there or that's even uh, not even transmitted to the public, might already be in stock prices. So the stock price has already gone up uh, before you thought of the good news that might arrive. So in that sense, uh, the price is always correct. All information is in there, because traders are probably very, probably very rational. Like traders, uh, typically they're very quantitative. They, they're good with numbers, with formulas, they're very quick thinkers. Uh, they can calculate what the value of a stock should be. So the thinking so far was, it's very hard to predict stock prices. All the information is already in the price. Well, recently, uh, we think, well, maybe that's not completely true. Are we really that rational? Are traders that rational? Uh, assume, or I assume for now, that you all have your driving's license. If you don't, just assume the next question will be about riding your bike. So I was told there are about 1,500 people here today. Uh, if you would line up, somebody has to be in the middle, right? And say this middle person, that's the average driver. So we go from the worst driver to the average driver to the best driver. If I would ask you, how many of you, please raise your hand if you are, are actually worse than the average driver? So maybe about 10%, uh, which is not untypical. That, that, that's what we have found before. Uh, is that rational? 
can pretty much everybody be better than the average? Well, probably, probably not, right? Or by definition not. So maybe people are overconfident. Maybe we are not as rational as some people would believe, and make us believe we are. Like maybe the market, because traders in the end are just people, maybe the market is not as rational. You sometimes see when good news comes out uh, in a firm, stock prices rise, obviously, because the future looks brighter, but you would see that it rise, rises too much. It actually sort of overshoots and then goes down a little. So people sort of overreact. They become too excited, maybe. So maybe the market is not always uh, that rational. So how could we think of a market with a lot of smart, professional traders, but also emotions, also, also irrationality in there? Well, Richard Thaler, uh, who's an economist from the United States, he asked the following question uh, in the Financial Times a few years back. Choose a number between one and 100, and the winning number will be that number that's closest to two thirds of the average. I say if, I, if we would play this game with three people, one would pick 80, one would pick 90, one would pick 100, then the average of these three numbers will be 90, so the winner will be that number that's closest to two thirds of 90, so 60. The number that's closest to 60 would win then. So think of it for yourself, which number would you pick, uh, given that you really want to win? So in the Financial Times, uh, example, you could win a, a trip to New York. Think about it for, for a few seconds. OK. Uh, if I could ask, did any of you choose a number that's above 70? Maybe only two people out of the whole room. Uh, well, that, 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 that makes sense, right? Uh, every number above 67 is not very rational. And if, if everybody would pick 100, uh, then, the, then two thirds of the average would be 67. So any number above 67 couldn't really win. So that would be an irrational choice. But even if you forget about that, uh, let's just assume that people pick randomly. So I'm the last one deciding. I think of all the other people, they probably picked randomly, so some of you picked a really low number, some of you picked a really high number, so the average would then be above, uh, about 50. It would be close to 50. So which number would I then pick? Well, I would pick two-thirds of 50 uh, or, or 33. How many, many of you picked 33? Not quite a few, uh, and that's what we see more. In fact, in the Financial Times article, that, that was a uh, newspaper, that was, was the number that was chosen the most. Uh, so they assume everybody else chooses randomly. I understand the game, so I'll pick two-thirds of the average if everybody chooses randomly. But maybe the other people in the room, they can think also, right? They're pretty smart, so maybe they figured it out uh, also. They figured this game out also. So they thought, well, everybody can do this thinking, so everybody would pick 33. So what would I then pick? I'll pick 22. I'll pick two thirds of 33. You can probably see where this is going, but maybe you could think of this also. So I would pick two thirds of 22. Now in the end, the rational, if everybody's rational, and, and I think that you're rational, everybody would pick one. Right, one would be the number that everybody picks. Of course, one was not the number that won the Financial Times article. Uh, the average there turned out to be 19, so 13 was the winning number. Uh, why is that? Well, even if you understand the game, of course, you have to take into account that maybe others don't. So to win this game, you have to be smart, you have to understand the game, but you also have to make an estimate how smart other people are, right? Or even how smart do other people think that other people are? <laughs> and this is pretty much the same in the stock market. With rational thinking and irrationality, uh, it's not only about uh, sort of doing calculations, it's also about thinking what other people think. And that's why I think that emotional intelligence is very important in the stock market these days. 
If you understand your own biases and the biases of others, the irrationalities of others, you might make a better trader. Why is this relevant? Well, I think uh, if you look at finance people, very often they think only in numbers and formulas, uh, and that's pretty much how we train them also. So maybe we should train our finance people more from the psychology side. Think more about emotions. And think about it, if, this, if you believe me that emotional intelligence are important in the stock market, but then think how important it would be in other areas, areas that are not dictated by numbers and formulas. But if you think in any other area, emotional intelligence is probably even more important. If you know your own desires, and you understand the desires of others, then you can really come up with solutions that make everybody happy. But with emotional intelligence, you can inspire or manage conflict if you have to. So given the theme of today, I think the lesson from the stock market is then really that emotional intelligence is the future of leadership. Thank you.